us into our feet. All right, who's got the Christmas shopping all finished up? Yeah, who's like just gets to start this week? <laughs> I love it. There was a split down the middle in the first service too. Um, well, hey, we're in the middle of our Christmas series on carols of Christmas. So every day we're doing some carols. Today we got Oh Holy Night lined up for you later in the service. And I know that's like some people's absolute all-time favorite. Who, who shares that sentiment? Favorite song of all time in Christmas, Oh Holy Night. Okay, well, you're getting, you get to have it today. Anyways, before we jump in and start singing all these songs and preaching, I wanted to make a shout out to all the visitors in the town that's visiting. This is your first time walking through the doors of Gray's Place and some weirdos talking about Christmas carols. Uh, we wanted to point out there's ways that we can answer questions for you on things that goes on here at Grace Place. And there's a lot that goes on here, um, but there's a, a visitor center outside. It's our Connect Center. It's the orange bo uh, box out there, but they're very, very, very friendly people out there. And they can answer all your questions for you, tell you all the cool things going on, like our Christmas Eve services that we got coming up this weekend. You ready for Christmas Eve? Yes. We got like eight songs lined up for that week, so that day. So be ready for it. Right now, we're going to sing some songs in this place. So you ready to sing out? Let's do it. Come on.
more time. So, Father, we come before you this morning in adoration, in worship of you and you alone. God, be with us during this season. Be with us this morning as we sing and lift your praises, as we hear the teaching of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. My name is Hollis. I'm one of the pastors on staff here at Grace Place. For those of you I haven't had the opportunity to meet, welcome. Really glad you guys are here this morning. Uh, you guys all ready for Christmas? No? How many of you know Christmas is next week? <laughs> you wouldn't guess it by the weather, man. You'd be out on the lake right now. Uh, it's a beautiful day. So thank you guys for being here this morning. And speaking of Christmas, I just want to say thank you. It is such a privilege to be a part of this church and a part of this congregation. Uh, for those of you who have been around, we had a giving tree that was out in the lobby, and you got to take tags off of that and bring gifts for people who are in, in need and bring hope to them. And uh, we're able to provide hams and stuff. And it's through our partnership with the Life Center, the Birth of Life Center and House of Neighborly Services. And you guys just went above and beyond. And just, it's such a privilege to see your generosity. And so Ginger, who's the director of House of Neighborly Services over there wrote us a card. And I just wanted to share that with you this morning. It says, Dear Grace Place, my first thought is, wow. Thank you for the overflowing blessings of hams, toys, toilet, toiletry bags, and more. I wish all of you could see just a glimpse of the mix of joy and relief on those we serve when they see that they are able to have a special Christmas because so many of you gave. Merry Christmas, Ginger. Yeah, so thank you guys so much, yeah. Thank you for your generosity, for your offerings, right? So there's a difference between the tithe and the offering. The tithe is what we bring on a consistent and regular basis. It's our first fruits, and then the offering is above and beyond. And so every year, at the end of the year, we do what's called a Bring Hope offering. And out in the lobby, at the curved wall, there's brochures that are out there if you want to learn more about that, or you can go on our website as well. But I want to highlight two things specifically off of that. <laughs> one I already did, House and Neighborly Services. That's our, our partnership. Um, another one is called Dream Makers. Uh, Dream Makers is for uh, foster kids who are aging out of the foster system. And if you want to learn more about that or connect with somebody whose life has been affected by that um, nonprofit, Sarah, who actually works in our cafe, uh, so she was a part of Dream Makers. Um, she was a recipient of them and now she also works for them in addition to working in the cafe. So if you wanna learn more about that nonprofit that we partner with, um, you're welcome to go out and talk to her. It's a beautiful nonprofit. The other thing I wanna bring up this morning, just kind of as a, a tangible thing so you guys can see kind of where and the impact that this has. So Pastor Clay and his wife, Celine, are getting ready to go to Uganda after Christmas. Uh, Clay's gonna preach like, I think, or teach 25 times during this this week that they're going to be there just ridiculous for me to think about teaching that many times but um, it's all to equip these pastors and their wives um, so Celine will be doing teaching as well and so they'll come from all over um, around Uganda all over the region uh, and so there's 50 pastors and their wives and then a number of elders and other people that are going to be coming and in order for them to get there, they, they, of course, it's not a wealthy country like we are. Um, they, they need to have funds to be able to transport them there, you know, buses or trucks, I don't know, whatever, however they transport people there, as well as housing and food and that kind of stuff. Um, so, so, that, so part of the Bring Hope offering will go to just that, to equipping pastors and their wives to go back into the mission field where God has called them to, to have an impact, to bring hope in whatever space they have. So, so when you give towards that Bring Hope Fund, um, you're impacting so many people, and that's just one example. And so there's a number of ways that you can give through Grace Place. You can give online at graceplace.org. 
You can text any amount to 84321, or you can give in the offering boxes at the back of the auditorium. And I just want to thank you in advance for your generosity. I'm looking forward to seeing what God does through this local expression of the church out into the community to build bridges, break barriers, ultimately to bring hope, the hope of Jesus. So I invite you to pray with me as we continue and get ready to step into the teaching portion of our worship. So Father, come before you, God, grateful, grateful for who you are. And I ask your blessing over our tithes and offerings. Would you multiply those and to bring hope to a dark world? And I ask your blessing over the people who give those, God, that you would increase their ability and that they would they would know you in a significant way through their obedience to what you plan in each of their hearts. And so, God, we come together this morning to be transformed by the hearing and the teaching of your words. I pray your anointing and blessing over Pastor Clay as he brings the message this morning. And it's in your holy and precious name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. In 1847, the wine commissioner in a small French town was also known for his poetry. He was talented. And so he was asked by the parish priest if he would write a special poem for Christmas Eve. So he went to Luke's account, and using Luke as a guide, he imagined in his poem what it would have been like for those who were eyewitnesses of Jesus' arrival in Bethlehem. And he called the poem Cantique de Noel. Upon completing the poem, he thought it was well done if he was to ask himself. And so he thought, you know, this should be a song. We need to put it to music. But he wasn't a musician. Fortunately, he had a friend who was a Jewish fellow who was a well-known classical musician. So he said, do you think you could put this to music before Christmas Eve? Three weeks later, at the midnight Christmas mass in that little French village, they sang the song. And it was an immediate hit. And soon it was being sung all over France. But not long after that, the author kind of walked away from faith, walked away from the church, joined the socialist movement. It was um, understood then that the person who penned the, the music for this song was a Jew and not a Christian. And so the, the church across the country suddenly, uniformly, denounced the song as unfit to sing at church. <clears throat> but the French people continued to sing it anyway. They liked it. And a decade later, an American fellow brought the song to a whole new audience halfway around the world. He translated it into English and published it under the name, O Holy Night. It became especially popular during the Civil War in the North because of the lyrics of the last verse that say this, truly he taught us to love one another. His law is love and his gospel is peace. Change shall he break, for the slave is our brother. And in him, in his name, all oppression shall cease. That's some good theology right there. Yes. Jump forward to Christmas Eve, 1906. The first radio broadcast of a human voice on the radio began with a man reading the Christmas story from Luke's gospel. And that shocked radio operators all over the place because they were used to hearing the Morse code and now they heard the voice of a man reading it seemed like a miracle. Then he picked up a violin and he played O Holy Night, which became the first song ever sent out over air radio waves. We're in a, uh, a series called Carols of Christmas and we're looking at different carols and the theology behind them. I think my favorite Christmas song, if you have to uh, push me to pick one, would be O Holy Night. It's at the top. I just love that song. I know many of you do. There is a long list of Christmas songs to choose from. You know that, right? I know because my wife subjects me to them nonstop starting way too early, before Thanksgiving. In fact, you know what she had the nerve to do? I have, in, in, I was going to say my, our garage, in our garage... I have a radio that plays 24-7. I just like to go out there and hear music. And it's always on 103.5. She goes out there secretively 
and changes it to Cozy 101. So I'm listening to this everywhere I go. And there are some songs for me, if I'm going to rate, rank them, that are at the very bottom of the list, such as Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer, I Want a Hippopotamus for Christmas, the Chipmunk song, Santa Baby, I Saw Mommy Kissing Santa Claus. I could probably add to that list. <clears throat> but somewhere at the top, I think at the very top for me, is Oh Holy Night. It's so worshipful. Before we sing that song, I want to turn your attention to Philippians chapter 2. If you have a Bible or a device you want to follow along, rather than going to... Matthew or Luke's gospel, where we read of Jesus' birth, we're going to go to Philippians 2 and contemplate the mystery of that holy night when God became man. And what we're going to see in these verses, verses 6 through 11, is how Jesus descended into greatness. And so let's read these verses together, and then we'll go back and kind of look at them closer verse by verse. Philippians chapter 2, beginning with verse 6. Jesus, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross." Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Powerful statement, isn't it? Jesus descended all the way to the deepest darkness of this world so that he could bring us up to dwell with him forever in glorious light. We did not participate in this rescue mission. We, we were not the ones responsible at all. We can only open up our empty hands of faith and receive the gift and get pulled out of our hopelessness because of his grace. We can never take credit for our rescue. Only live lives of gratitude as a response. That's the gospel. That's the good news. Now, <clears throat> Scholars believe that the verses we just read from Philippians 2 represent an early Christian poem or creedal statement, likely a hymn that the early church sang together. So whether Paul wrote it himself or someone else wrote it and he quoted it in his letter to the Philippians, it probably was already well known when they read it. The conclusion comes, this conclusion from studying, like some people like to really look deeply at literature and studying the style of the Greek writing, um, noting the arrangement of six stanzas with three lines each, distinct parallelism, repetition, rhythm. And in fact, when you look at the structure, uh, it shows a downward humiliation and then an upward exaltation. In fact, look at it in this way. Uh, <clears throat> We rented a digital wall for our Christmas services, so we're experimenting with it today. A little different than what we're used to. But notice how this text starts, In very nature God, not to be grasped, made himself nothing, descending. Nature of a servant in human likeness, humbled himself, obedient to death, even death on a cross. And then there's a turn. God exalted him, name above all names. Every knee should bow in heaven on earth. Every tongue confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. It's a beautiful hymn, rich in theological meaning. A succinct statement of what early Christ followers believed about Jesus, about their faith. His rescue mission chronicled in two phases, humiliation and exaltation. First, notice the humiliation. This passage takes us from the highest heights to the lowest depths, and first we're told, number one, that Jesus was eternally God. Verse six, who being in very nature God. You don't get any higher than that. <laughs> that, that that's his starting place, as high as it gets. He was never created. He is the creator. He's not a God. The text says he is in very nature God. 
It's impossible, I know, for us with our finite human minds to grasp this. We receive it by faith and accept it. We live in a world where everything has a beginning and an end. And so it's very difficult for us to think about what the Bible teaches about God always existing. He's always been and will always be. Just because we can't grasp that doesn't make it not so. He's before all things. He has existed eternally. Now, <clears throat> Christianity is unique among religions in that it teaches one God who exists in three personalities, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the triune God, the Godhead, the Trinity. In John 17, 5, Jesus prayed that the Father would glorify him with the same glory they had together before the world began. I had a conversation with a young man a while back asking questions. <clears throat> I love to engage with people who have sincere questions about faith. And he said, if God created this world to have someone to love, then that means God has needs. And if he needs us so that he has love, then how can he really be the almighty God? The answer to that is found in the reality of the Trinity, the triune God, a God who is three in one and eternally so God has always dwelt in community. St. Augustine long ago said, if your God is alone, then he is not much of a God. Why? Because if God was alone, then he would never have loved until he created. But if God always existed in loving community, then when he did create, it was not to get love, but to give love. Jesus was and is fully God and eternally God. Now, I know it's very popular today in our culture to uh, talk about Jesus in a different way and say, ah, oh, he was just a teacher, a guru, a mystic, a prophet, something else. I was conversing with a young atheist who said, I respect Jesus. I just don't believe he's the son of God. And that might sound sophisticated, but how can you respect someone who claimed to be something he wasn't? You see, Jesus claimed to be one with the Father eternally. And many other claims about his divinity, able to forgive sins, able to raise the dead, going to judge the living and the dead, and on it goes. If Jesus wasn't God, then his claims were either, makes, his claims make him either a deceiver and the worst deceiver ever, or a crazy man who is completely out of his mind. Now, some skeptics today are saying that the notion that Jesus was God was something that developed as a legend many years later after Jesus came to this earth. And that Jesus was, was human, but later Christians decided to make him a God. But keep in mind that this statement of faith that we're reading here was one that was repeated by the first century believers. Some of them had seen Jesus and heard Jesus. They were eyewitnesses. Some of them were hearing about him from eyewitnesses. This is a very early statement of belief. And it indicates that Jesus was and is fully and eternally God. But what did he do? He humbled himself in order to go down into the darkness on a rescue mission. Notice his descent. Number two, Jesus laid down rights, privileges, and power we read in verse 6 and 7, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. Jesus was equal with God, but he did not regard that privilege, the text says, as something to be grasped. In other words, he, he didn't feel like he had to pull himself higher and cling to his rights. Now, <clears throat> think of Jesus as the opposite of our, our first father, Adam. Adam was not equal with God, but he sought to grasp a higher status. Jesus, who we're told was a second Adam, he was equal with God, but let his rights go in order to move to a lower status. The text says he emptied himself. The Greek word for that is kenosis, and you wouldn't believe this if, if you haven't done the research, but there have been dozens and dozens historically of books written on this one word. Because there's been a lot of discussion as to what it means that Jesus emptied himself. And some come, I think, to wrong conclusions. Some said that means he ceased to be God. Um, some say he was stripped of all of his divine attributes. 
But I believe, uh, rightly understood, Jesus never ceased to be God, but what he did is he willingly laid down divine rights, privileges, and power in order to live truly as a man. He willingly chose to lay down the independent use of his divine power. Not that he didn't have it, but he provided an example of dependence on God from beginning to end. And in that sense, he emptied himself. Never stopped being God. Imagine that you were visiting a hospital and it, there's a lot of traffic, so you're trying to find a parking place and there's no place up close. Um, used to be, by the way, they had a reserved parking for clergy at hospitals. You could pull right up. That went away a long time ago. Um, in fact, when I first started, I could golf for free because I was a pastor. Can you believe that? <laughs> now I get charged double because I'm a pastor. No. Uh, <laughs> Things have changed. But say you're, you're, you're circling the parking lot and, and you have to park far away and, and you get out of your car and there's somebody just, just pulling in the parking lot and you don't know which direction to go. It's a huge complex. And so he rolls down the window and you ask him, um, I need to go here. How do I get there? And he says, well, hang on, I'll park next to you and show you the way. And as you're walking, you find out he's the chief surgeon at the hospital who does has, have his own reserve spot, but he gave it up to show you the way. He gave up his privilege to show you the way. Did he give up his title as chief surgeon to do that? No. He just gave up his privilege of a close-up parking lot. Jesus did not give up his status as God. But he did give up his rights, privileges, and power as God for the purpose. Number three, Jesus became truly human. Being made in human likeness and being found appearance as a human being. Jesus, who was fully God, also became fully man. He entered the womb of Mary through a miracle of the Holy Spirit of God. He became a part of his own creation. And what a blessing it is every Christmas season that we wonder anew at this mystery of the incarnation. Emmanuel, God with us. Oh, holy night. Jesus was not a sinner in need of a savior like us. He was fully human, but think of him more like Adam before the fall in his humanity. Hebrews 4.15 says he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. I believe that his biggest temptation was to rely on his own power rather than depending on the Father, which is also a temptation that we have. <clears throat> but it was a much greater temptation for him because he actually had the power, and we don't. Jesus became fully human. There was nothing, nothing special about him, the Bible says, in terms of his outward appearance that would set him apart from everyone else. In fact, so, uh, Isaiah 53, 2 says, in a prophecy of the coming Messiah, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He humbled himself. You might say, now, now so far, what does this mean for me? Well, First of all, Jesus is God. That means no problem is too big for him. You believe that? Remember that. Don't tell God how big your problems are. Tell your problems how big your God is. Jesus became human. That means he understands what you go through on the human level. He was tempted. He was hungry. He was thirsty. He was tired. He was lonely. He was falsely accused. He was betrayed. He was in pain. On the other hand, he laughed, he enjoyed good food and companions. He understands us. Now watch further this descent of the passage. Number four, Jesus became a humble servant. Taking the very nature of a servant, he humbled himself. And Jesus could have come to this earth as a king in all his glory, but he came instead as a servant. In fact, the Greek word doulos in the text is often translated slave. Now, this is not, the way Jesus arrived is not the way kings or queens normally travel. Philip Yancey wrote a book called The Jesus I Never Knew. And in it, he writes of how a number of years ago, Queen Elizabeth II visited the U.S. And he writes this. Her 4,000 pounds of luggage included two outfits for every occasion. 4,000 pounds. Whoa. Uh, two outfits for every occasion. Uh, a morning outfit in case someone died, 40 pints of plasma, and white kid leather toilet seat covers. Sounds comfy. 
She also brought along with her her own hairdresser, two valets, a host of other attendants. A brief visit of royalty to a foreign country can easily cost $20 million. And then uh, Yancey writes, in meek contrast, God visit, God's visit to earth took place in an animal shelter with no attendants present and nowhere to lay the newborn king but a feed trough. Indeed, the event that divided history and even our calendars into two parts may have had more animal than human witnesses. A mule could have stepped on him, he writes. You see, God's kingdom is upside down. We love, in our culture, we love to hear the rise from nothing stories. We like, we like the rags to riches stories, the popper to king, the janitor to CEO, the log cabin to the White House. But Jesus went down. He descended into greatness. And Jesus told his disciples if they wanted to be great in God's eyes, they need to learn how to serve. And he modeled that for them, what he was talking about when he washed the disciples' feet the night before the cross. Jesus taught that life is more about giving than about getting. And he stated, in fact, that he did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And uh, that's the main application, by the way, that Paul's making. If you look at the extended context, verse 5, that we didn't read before these verses we did read, Paul says, uh, look at the example of Jesus and let that be your mindset and your attitude. And then he talks about how he descended into greatness. Jesus became a humble servant. And 5, Jesus was obedient to death. Verse 8 says, Jesus placed himself in submission to the Father and was faithful and obedient as far as necessary, which in this case was even to death. Now, <clears throat> don't think it was easy for him because he was a son of God. No, it was not easy because he truly became human and in his humanity and in his emotions, he struggled for example, Hebrews 5, 7 and 8 says, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And on the night before Jesus died, he agonized. And in fact, it was so intense that he sweat drops of blood and he prayed, Father, if willing, if you're willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. And even though that was a struggle, he persevered all the way to death for you. We're going to do something a little bit different today. And I'm going to pause before we look at his exaltation briefly. And we're going to celebrate communion together as we think about what he did for us. Um, if you did not receive a, a, a packet like this and you'd like one, the ushers are coming to the front right now and you can catch their attention. There's two little flaps, one for the wafer and one for the bread. I'm going to pray before we take it, but before we do that, let me, t let me remind you. Jesus was obedient to death, but not just any death. He was not just a victim of crime or a religious martyr. Number six, Jesus suffered the worst possible death. Verse eight says, even death on a cross. That's as low as it goes. You see, death on a cross was reserved for the most despised criminals in the Roman Empire. It was, in fact, illegal to crucify a Roman citizen. That's how degrading it was. In fact, polite Romans considered it an obscenity to even say the word cross. I can assure you no one was wearing a cross necklace at that time. Jews considered a person hanging on a cross to be under the curse of God. Based on the law, God gave Moses, Deuteronomy 21, 23, anyone hung on a tree is under curse. So what happened to Jesus was not a cruel and degrading form of punishment only. But he suffered the wrath of God on sin. And he, he took the penalty for every sinner on that cross. He became a curse as he bore our sins. 
He gave his life a ransom for many, as he declared he would. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, this made the death of Jesus different from any other death ever possible, the worst possible death, because as our substitute, he bore the penalty for sin in himself. He sensed separation from his father. He tasted death for every person. He experienced hell, the horrors of hell as he looked into it. And, and he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Before we take communion, I want to invite you to pray with me as we, we consider this reality. Thank you, Jesus, for going as far as you did in this downward downward descent to become human and to go all the way to the cross. Thank you that as we put our faith in you, we find forgiveness because you have borne the curse for us and reversed that curse. Thank you for giving your life as a ransom for sin. And as we take and eat and drink these reminders of your body and your blood poured out for us. You said, do this in remembrance of me. Don't forget. And so we remember and we do so with appreciation and gratitude in our hearts as we say thank you. Let us take and eat and drink. Amen. Now listen, Jesus went as far as necessary down the shaft of darkness to save you, even death on a cross. Now after those six steps down from the highest height to the lowest depth, there's a sudden turn from Christ's humiliation to his exaltation. And I want you to see this before we sing. Two more realities about Christ are communicated. Number one, Jesus' victory is perfect and finished. Verse 9 says, Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. Through his perfect life, substitutionary death, victorious resurrection, Jesus, Jesus satisfied the Father. And at his ascension, he returned to his position formally of equality with the Father. And his work was declared perfect and finished. All authority was given him on heaven and earth. He now has authority to judge over all the universe. He is Lord of the dead and the living. I'm quoting from Bible verses here. All things have been placed under his feet. And on and on we could go to declare his triumph. Jesus' victory is perfect and finished. And number two, Jesus Christ is Lord of all forever. Verse 10 and 11, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What is the name that is above all names? Is it his given name, Jesus? Is it his title that means the anointed one, Messiah, Christ? And then there's so many other titles for Jesus, Emmanuel, Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace, uh, the Almighty, the Ancient of Days, the Door, the Chief Shepherd, the Good Shepherd, the Word, the Light, the Lamb, the Bread of Life, the Rock, the Bridegroom, the Lion of the Tribe of, of Judah, the Alpha and the Omega, and on it goes. So what is the name that is above all names? I submit to you it is Lord. That name trumps all titles because of what it communicates to us. He is Lord. And you know the statement, Jesus is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord was the earliest Christian creed. If you could de declare that and believe that in your heart and in your head and declare it with your mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord, that was the statement of faith. Some denominations have pages of, of statement of faith today. The early Christian church, that was it. Jesus Christ is Lord of all 
and forever. Amen? To Jesus as Lord, every knee will bow, the text says, in heaven and on earth, under the earth. That is, angels, humans, demons, every rational being in this universe will bow to Jesus as Lord. Now, don't misunderstand. This text is not teaching universalism. The Bible does not teach that everyone will be saved. But it does teach that everyone will acknowledge Jesus' rightful rule as Lord. Either in this life, bowing in adoration and worship, or in the final judgment, in truthful recognition that he is just. You don't choose if you bow and confess, only how and when. And so I encourage you to do it willingly and do it now. Don't wait. I read a touching uh, Christmas story about some poor country children who each year eagerly awaited their father's arrival from his job at a foundry in the city. And every year he came home for Christmas and he brought them presents and he put up a Christmas tree that they could all decorate together. But sadly, this year he had been laid off and they were disappointed to find there was no money for presents or even a tree. Kids still held out hope their dad would come up with a tree. Dad promised he'd do what he could, so he went out in the garage and later he emerged with a two by four with a stand on it about five feet tall and had holes drilled in each side. And he went down the street to a neighbor who had property with beautiful evergreens lining you know, three sides of the property. And he asked if he could prune a tree with just a couple branches here and there that he could put onto his tree. They said, sure. He was trying, but by no stretch of the imagination could it be called a Christmas tree when it was done. And the kids were trying to deal with their disappointment. One little girl who later would write this story was looking out the window and she was praying. And as she was praying, there was a knock on the door. And they opened the door, the woman and her son from the property where they had got a few pine branches was standing there and the sun was propping up the tallest, most beautiful shaped Christmas tree they'd ever seen, filled the whole doorway. The woman had also kindly gone and, and purchased and wrapped a few presents for each of the family members, which was gonna be all they got that year. And every year as she was growing up, the woman who wrote the story said, there was this gaping hole in the row of evergreen trees around the neighbor's property as a reminder of that act of kindness and how God had answered her prayers. Now I want to ask you a question. How would that neighbor have felt if she'd cut down that tree for that family and bought those presents and came to their house to make the delivery and they said, you know, we, we, can't, we can't accept that, thank you anyway. We really aren't interested and politely shut the door. Don't you think that would have hurt her feelings? And, and furthermore, by refusing the gift, they would have not only hurt her feelings, they would have hurt themselves. The family would have missed the great joy of the Christmas they were able to celebrate. You see, a gift only brings joy if it's received. How do you think God feels if you push him away and refuse the gift? Look how far he went to provide you with the gift of eternal life. The world may give, give you superficial happiness, but it will not last. The only way to know the deep abiding joy of God that he wants for you is to be reconciled to him through his son, Christ Jesus, the Lord. It's the greatest gift you can ever receive, but it's only yours if you receive it. So I know many of you have already received that gift and I want you during this last song to just appreciate the Lord from your heart and worship him with gladness. And if you have not yet said yes to him, why not now? Even as you sing this song, just surrender your life to him and say, Jesus, I wanna receive you as Lord of my life. I give my heart to you. Thank you for being my savior. Would you stand for me, with me, excuse me? <laughs> Stand with me and join me as we worship. I want to encourage you to open up your heart to him.
and worship him. Sweet hymns of joy and grateful chorus raise we. Let all within us praise his holy name.
Well, another Christmas carol under our belt, right? Oh, Holy Night's probably one of my favorite too, if I'm being honest with myself. Before you guys leave today, we have some really important announcements and we wanna make sure that no one walks out the door before they hear all of them. So this first one is that we have an extra service this week on Thursday night. It's the longest night service. Technically, yes, this Thursday is the longest night of the year, um, but we're doing a special Christmas service for that. Uh, and. It, I don't know if some people actually struggle with getting through the season because maybe they've lost loved ones or it's just, it's a sorrowful time for a lot of people. And so this service is actually orientated around that specific ministry. So if maybe uh, it resonates with anyone here and you're like, yeah, I could actually use a service like that, then th Thursday night, put that on, on your calendars right there, okay? Seven to eight o'clock. And then lastly, we have Christmas Eve services coming up this weekend. And you see these dates behind me here, the 23rd, 24th, three o'clock, 4.30, six o'clock. Look, none of those times on there say nine o'clock or 10.30 Sunday morning, okay? And I know some of you are just tenacious enough to show up on a Sunday morning, and the only person more tenacious than you is probably Tyler, who, who would probably be here. But if you show up, he'll put you to work and say, we have services later on in the afternoon. So don't come to church next Sunday in the morning time. Pick one of those six service times to do Christmas Eve with us because it's gonna be a massive fun time at Christmas Eve. I think we have eight more service, eight more songs that we're gonna sing for you on Christmas Eve. So you should all know the lyrics, all these great Christmas songs. Otherwise, if you need prayer for anything, we got our prayer partners in the back. If you haven't got that Christmas shopping done yet, go get on it right now. We hope to see you at one of those Christmas Eve services. Have a blessed day. Take care.